What's going on, engineers? So there's a common scenario that people will run into all the time when they're operating a Linux system and they have an application they want to deploy there is that they'll log into the Linux system and then they'll wonder, how can I get my application to start up automatically when the system starts? And this is true whether you've built a web application or a web service or some tool that's designed to run a Linux system or something else. While there's a number of options for starting up and keeping our program running, System D is a good choice because on most modern Linux distributions, you will have System D on there by default. In fact, it's going to be the default init system. If you watched my init system video back in the past, you probably recall that the kernel starts System D as PID1 and System D goes on to start everything else. And what makes this a good choice for your program is that that everything else could also be your program. If you happen to choose no service manager to help start your program, it's very likely that, that service manager would have been started by system D. That is to say, system D starts the service manager, service manager starts your program. So why not just cut out the middleman and have system D start your program? Anyway, let's jump in and make it happen. So the way system D organizes programs that it should manage is in what they call units. And then it uses these things called unit files, which you can see here, which will describe a given unit. What you see here can be thought of as a really, really basic unit file. The format of the unit file is sections, in this case, unit service and install, and then key value pairs of directives. So basically what this unit file does is it gives a name to our service. So our service is called some really important service. Under the service section, it has a type, which is simple. It's also the default and it's the most common one, but there are other options. This just says what type of service it is. It specifies the working directory that it should switch into before it runs your program. Exec start takes this program and runs it when the service starts. And then in the install section, there's this thing called wanted by. And because units can depend on each other, this is saying that once a, once the service is installed to the system, make it wanted by the multi-user target. And this is actually what allows it to start up when the system starts. Now, of course, unit files have tons more options than what I've listed here, and we'll look at a more complicated unit file in a second. Now, as far as the program that you want to start, notice that I just specified the absolute path of the program. So microprogram.sh, if I open that up, we can see that it's just a simple while loop that sleeps every three seconds and it echoes service is working. Now, you'll notice that I didn't start this with any particular program. I didn't do bash root program.sh or anything like that. And that's because I supplied the shebang up here to specify that I want this to run as bash. Certainly, if I didn't want to use this line or if I wanted to use another program, I could have just added it here. However, I should use the full path for that. So once you have your unit file all set, now you need to make systemd aware of this actual unit file. And the most common way to do this is to take this file and store it in slash etsy slash systemd slash system. Now, once you're in here, you could either copy the file directly in here or you could symlink it. That's entirely up to you. In our case, we'll do nano dot sample.service. I'm going to take all of this information and drop it into here, and then I will save it. Now, once your service is in here, there's about four things that you typically do. You can start it, stop it, enable it, and disable it. And these commands can be shown here. And then after each of those commands, you'll specify the name of the service. You could either do sample or sample.service. It will look for either one. Starting it and stopping it is self-explanatory, but enable and disable, what that does is if it's enabled, it's gonna start when the system boots. If it's disabled, it's not gonna start when the system boots. So when you're setting up a new systemd unit, it's common to start it without enabling it just to make sure it works and then stop it. And then once you're confident that everything's good to go, then you can enable it and then you're all set. I also even restart the system once I enable it just to make sure it does in fact start up. So step one, start our service. Just take this command, copy it, and we're good. Now that our service is active, and because our script here is outputting some stuff, everything that does output goes into the journal, and we can look at the journal with journal ctl-f. And we can see now it says service is working every three seconds. So now that that's all good, we can exit that. Now if we want to stop our program, it's system ctl stop sample. And that's it, it stopped. For a little bonus commands, we can actually check the status of a service. So instead of doing systemctl stop, we can do systemctl status sample. And this will show us some information about what's going on. It'll tell you the name of the service. It'll say what file it loaded, the fact that it's disabled, and it's currently inactive. And then it also shows 10 or so lines of the last output that it had. And then it shows that it was stopping and then stopped it. So finally, our program is ready. It's time to actually enable it so it starts up when the system starts. So we'll do systemctl enable sample. 
There's a couple ways we can verify that it is in fact enabled. We can either do systemctl status sample, which will say now enabled. The other thing we can do is systemctl list unit files, which will list us all the unit files in the system. We can do slash sample to search for it. And you see sample.service is enabled. And then finally, if you wanted to actually make it so it didn't start when the system booted up, you can just do systemctl disable sample. And that's really it for very basic unit files. Now I said we'd look at a more complex configuration, so let's go ahead and do that now. So under the unit section, we'll see three new directive, wants, requires, and after. And all three of these deal in managing the dependencies between units. Wants basically says that once this unit is started up, it should also start up those other services. If those other services are already running, of course, then it simply does nothing. Requires is almost exactly like wants, except when it starts up a particular service, if that service fails to start, then your unit will also fail to start. Now the last one is after. The thing with wants and requires is it doesn't deal in the actual ordering. All it does is it says, okay, well, this unit wants these two services, so I'll start those up as well. But what they do is they're going to all start up simultaneously. If you specify an after directive, it'll guarantee that your unit will start up after that service. So in the service section, we have a bunch of new directives here. The first is user and group, and these are pretty self-explanatory. Once the service starts up, they should start as a particular user or a particular group. It's pretty common to use environment variables in a program. So to do this, you can simply do environment equals, and then the name of the variable equals, and then whatever the value is. And of course, you can specify multiple environment directives. Next new directive is timeout sec, and there's also timeout start sec and timeout stop sec, and all this does is it says this program should have up to 30 seconds to start and up to 30 seconds to stop. Another good directive that's very useful is restart and restart sec. What this says is if the service were to shut down for some reason, then it should restart always. Now, of course, always is not the only option. It can be on failure or simply off entirely. And then restart sec basically says once it is restarted, how long should it take before it should restart? And again, these are all just more configuration options that you can have just to make your unit better. And even though this was our complex example, there's still way more options that I didn't even cover here, but I did want to provide a very simple unit file and then a slightly more complex one just to show that there are more options. Fortunately, systemd is well documented and you can see exactly which directives are under each section and exactly how to use them and what they do. And that brings us to the end of the video. This is a really simple to use, very reliable way to get programs running on your server and keep them running. It's a challenge that everybody has to deal with and this is certainly one way to deal with it. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw in this video, please leave them below in the comments. And other than that, hope to see you in the next video. Take care.